Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, the government is outlining how it wants to stop judges in European courts from being able to overturn the courts in the UK after Brexit. At the moment, it's possible for some cases that have gone through the British court system to be ruled on in the Court of Justice of the European Union, which is based in Luxembourg. Here's how it works at the moment. There are actually two courts here. The Court of Justice, that's where national courts can ask for EU laws to be clarified and EU countries can get into trouble for breaking EU rules. And the General Court, where decisions made by the European institutions can be challenged by countries, companies and individuals. It means all sorts of stuff comes up. For example, today's cases include sharing airline passengers' details with Canada which countries should process refugees, something about a German cosmetics company. But remember, this is absolutely not the European Court of Human Rights. That's totally different, totally separate. All these guys, and they are mainly guys, have served here in the past. Nowadays, every member state gets at least one judge here. Should we go and see them in action? La cour. Avec les articles 7, 8 et 21, ainsi qu'avec l'article 52, paragraphe 1 de la charte des droits fondamentaux. Slovenska Republika a Maďarsko procès proti... qui a mené à la décision si cette clause contractuelle est conditionnée par la nature du produit, mm -hmm. si elle est fixée si de façon est uniforme, est uniforme est appliquée est indifféremment. This is every judgment from the 1950s till about 2010 in multiple languages. To supporters of this place, it's amazing. Transnational justice in action. To critics, these are examples of foreign judges interfering in other countries. We have a stream of cases coming in, round about 700 cases every year. We have neither the time nor the inclination to sit around hatching some federalist plots. So, where do we think this place will feature in the Brexit negotiations? Well, the EU wants a big future role for the ECJ, particularly when it comes to the rights of EU citizens living in the UK. The British government isn't quite so sure. Anyway, case definitely not closed. Well, let's talk to Alfonso Valero from Nottingham Trent University, who's an expert on European law. Ali Renison is from the Institute of Directors, and Peter Stockdale from the English Bridge Union that's recently taken its case to the European Court of Justice over whether or not it's a sport. Well, Peter, let's talk about your experiences first of all. Why did you feel you needed to go to the ECJ? Well, there's a, um, an EU directive that there should be no VAT charged on the entry fee for participation in sport, but there is no clear definition on what constitutes a sport. Um, when the government most recently gave their definition, they included bridge, but HMRC weren't um, applying the directive to bridge, um, so it was referred to the European courts for a clearer definition on what they meant by sport. And it ruled in your favour, so you were presumably delighted. We are delighted, though it hasn't actually delivered its final ruling. There's been a recommendation that the ruling should be in our favour, but that still needs to be approved in October. Alfonso, I want to bring you in, because this is a hugely complicated issue, and people may be sitting at home scratching their heads saying, why on earth is this relevant to me in my everyday life? Well, the uh, role of the ECJ as such is quite relevant insofar as it rules on the rights in relation, for example, to consumer legislation, to uh, data protection, and uh, things as maybe it would seem originally as remote as the composition of chemical products. So the ECJ has definitely a significant influence in the interpretation of that law that affects uh, citizens and businesses in our daily life. Alison, what are you, Ali, what are you concerned about with the changes that the government is likely to propose in the light of Brexit? 
I think the big question is, is what actually replaces it and are the rights preserved in terms of the ability of individuals and businesses to bring their cases, dispute settlement issues um, to whatever replaces the ECJ? Because currently under the ECJ, virtually anyone um, uh, can challenge um, another entity under EU law. And I think the, the concern is that if we look at some of the other models that the government is potentially thinking about, uh, they tend to deal predominantly with sort of state to state dispute resolution, not necessarily affording individual and businesses the same ease of access and rights in which to to sort of pursue uh, disputes. But of course, any European citizens who remain here after Brexit will still be able to use the court. They? Yeah, they'll certainly be able to use the British courts. I think that there is actually some debate specifically on the issue of ECJ jurisdiction on citizens' rights who are currently here going forward about whether the ECJ absolutely needs to have a role for that particular issue. Um, I know that within the legal and academic community, some people do think that the, e the EU is slightly sort of um, uh, overshot what it's asking for in that respect. But I think the wider question is, is who interprets um, the withdrawal all agreement once we leave the EU. That's a much bigger question. Alfonso, what about the benefits? Do you see that there could be any benefits to the government's proposals, the idea of getting rid of the ECJ playing a role in these, um, in these everyday decisions? Well, one benefit would be the fact that uh, British courts, UK courts, tend to be a bit faster in the resolution that if you need to refer a question to the ECJ in Luxembourg, where sometimes it is true the, uh, the, there could be a delay of years in obtaining a decision. That certainly will be one of the primary benefits in doing so. It's obviously the other consideration is that whether that has, uh, on the other hand, uh, the um, disadvantage for the UC, the UK citizens of I the interpretation by the UK courts, which differs or may differ substantially from that of the ECJ. Peter, for you, if you hadn't have been able to go to the European Court of Justice, presumably this would have meant that you would have had to start paying VAT for bridge, you wouldn't have had that exemption, it would have cost your sport. Um, well, we have been paying VAT, mm. um, so hopefully going forward there will be no VAT charged on, on bridge activities, making it cheaper um, for everyone to take part and hopefully we can wider involvement in bridge through this reduction in costs. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you as well to Alonso joining us from Nottingham. Uh, now, more Brexit papers published today. So Vince Cable has accused the government of a Brexit climb down. And this is after the release of a policy paper which appears to show the European Court of Justice would still influence UK law after Brexit. I'm going to be speaking to Dominic Raab, the Minister for Courts of Justice at 8.30 this morning. But in the meantime, Jonathan's got a bit more detail on a rather complicated subject, Jonathan. Yeah, it is complicated. It was a red line, wasn't it, for Brexiteers regaining control of UK law. Always been one of the key arguments for leaving the European Union, of course. But the UK would need to set out its own laws for the enforcement of rights and the resolution of international disputes. So Sarah Jane says it is complicated, but what exactly does the European Court of Justice do? Well, let's take a closer look. Uh, the ECJ settles disputes between member states, ensuring states comply with legal obligations and interpret EU law for national courts. Now, currently, it has total control over the rights of EU citizens living in the UK and, of course, UK citizens in Europe. Now, leaving the ECJ would throw up a whole range of issues, including rights for EU nationals' family members, as well as the loss of rights for UK citizens living in the EU. Well, let's head to Westminster, try and get some clarity from our senior political correspondent, Jason Farrell. Uh, so, Jason, Sir Vince Cable has said that this is a climb down by the government. Uh, what's your interpretation? Well, it seems that the government is trying to set out a range of options for settling disputes. It's putting forward this paper and saying effectively that it, well, the, the, the key line that's been picked up by a lot of people is that we would no longer be under the direct jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice after leaving the EU. And the thing that people have picked up on is this, this line direct, because uh, that line was not, the word direct, was not used by Theresa May when she said that we would uh, leave the jurisdiction uh, of the, the European Court of Justice. It's not been used in any uh, government documents prior to this. And uh, the potential reference uh, that people take from that is that perhaps there would be some kind of indirect control. This document will argue uh, that countries like Canada and Switzerland have independent agreements and settlements of disputes uh, without those countries being subject 
uh, to the ECJ, but it also makes references to countries uh, like Norway and Iceland that do sometimes voluntarily refer to the European Court of Justice. So is there going to be some kind of voluntary reference? And if that is the case, then would how much power would the European Court still have over the UK after leaving? And if they still do have that power, then what's the point of leaving the single market and so on and so forth? So the argument goes. So what Vince Cable has been saying is that the lines have been blurred. Keir Starmer also says that this could be uh, potentially significant. The government have uh, released a statement saying they've always been clear that dispute resolution will require a new and unique solution for the UK. OK, Jason, many thanks. Uh, more now on Brexit. Critics are saying the government has modified its stance over what role the European Court of Justice will play uh, after we leave the EU. A new government paper expected out very shortly indeed. Uh, we're told talks only of ending direct jurisdiction, which Labour and the Lib Dems say fall short of what Theresa May had previously said she wanted. This is part of what the Prime Minister said on the question in January. We will take back control of our laws and bring an end to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in Britain. Leaving the European Union will mean that our laws will be made in Westminster, Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. And those laws will be interpreted by judges not in Luxembourg, but in courts across this country. Because we will not have truly left the European Union if we are not in control of our own laws. And to be fair to the Prime Minister, she's just talked in Guildford half an hour ago in which she said something not entirely dissimilar. Uh, let's go to Westminster, the Labour MP and co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on EU Relations. Chukramuna is there. Chukramuna, a very good morning to you. Um, Prime Minister's just said, at the end of the day, when it comes to the crunch in the future, uh, the ultimate resting place of law will be with our Supreme Court, not the European Court of Justice. Well, I'm not sure that's quite right. And these position papers, the next one is being published at midday. But what I would ask your viewers to go back to is what they were promised during the European referendum, particularly those watching this programme who voted to leave the European Union. And you'll remember that you were told by the likes of Michael Gove, Boris Johnson, Andrea Leadsom, Liam Fox, other members of the government, that if you voted to leave the European Union, European judges would have no impact or say on the application of law in this country. And what it would seem from the pre-briefing of this paper, um, which will be published at midday, is that that is not actually the case. And that there will be a role in some way, shape or form for European judges, at least in the policing of the agreements and the arrangements between us and the European Union once we've left the European Union. So that is the core thing I'd ask people to reflect on. That is the test, if you, would, if you like. But the European Court of Justice has, uh, quote, indirect jurisdiction over all kinds of entities that are, that are not necessarily inside the European Union. I mean, for example, one recent example, you've got Google being given a whopping, what was it, a couple of billion pound fine by the European Commission. If Google decide to appeal that, the organisation, the agency they will go to, with that appeal will be the European Court, Court of Justice. Yeah, and that's that's indirect ju jurisdiction for a company yeah. which the last time I looked was based in America, not the EU. That's right. Um, but of course, the terms under which Brexit was sold to your viewers was that indirect or direct, European judges weren't going to have an impact on UK law. Mm. And here we have today the government acknowledging that there will be attention paid to the jurisprudence, the judgment of European judges when interpreting whether the arrangements between us, the agreements between us and the European Union once we've left, whether they have been um, properly complied with. And that is different from what people were sold during the referendum well, campaign. And it's yeah. part of a look, it's, Colin, it's part of a, a wider story that's emerged over the summer on all of the promises that were made like the £350 million extra per week for public services. Well, given the government over the summer has acknowledged we will be paying a divorce bill to leave the European Union and there are likely to be ongoing payments to access the single market um, after that divorce bill is paid, you can't get your £350 million extra per week. Or, you, or take immigration. You know, you've, you've interviewed lots of people about that um, issue on this programme. You were told during the referendum there will be no more preferential access to the UK for EU citizens after we've left the European Union. You've got government ministers like David Davis acknowledging there is going to have to be some kind of preferential access for Euro European citizens to come in to help um, you know, our NHS work, to help certain industries yeah. that can agriculture 
culture for them to get the people they need to do the jobs yeah. that we're going to have to have EU citizens yeah. coming here afterwards. Okay. So I suppose the point I'm making is I just think what's happening with this position paper on the European Court of Justice just illustrates that actually the terms under which you were sold Brexit are impossible but, but for government to deliver. The, the thing is, I mean, you know, we're, we're doing this interview 20 minutes too soon, aren't we? So we, we don't know precisely what's going to be in the position paper. I know, paper. maybe you should, have had him, you should have had me on later. <laughs> maybe we should have back, done it afterwards. Come back. We'll, we'll <laughs> I'll come back. back. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, for instance, what we, we don't know whether to what extent these may be transitional arrangements. So, for instance, if you look at some of the pan-European agencies uh, which are regulated and governed by European Court of Justice rules, European Air Safety Agency, European Arrest Warrant, European Medicines Agency, for example, sure. um, in time we may set up parallel organisation to all those currently EU agencies, but it's going to take time. So there's a transitional period when we may require the judgments of the ECJ. But, again, I go back to what people were promised. They were told during that referendum that once we leave in March 2019, we will not have anything to do with all these arrangements and organisations that we've been part of as a result of our membership of the European Union. And what the government seems to be seeking to do now with the transition arrangements, and hey, I welcome this, is basically having dismantled all the arrangements that we've had, which up until now have been permanent, they want to put them all back into place temporarily. And I think that says something. Why is it that we need to be putting in place these things again during transition, like the, the customs um, union. These customs arrangements the government's proposed um, for the two years after we've left the European Union mean that essentially we'll continue to be part of the customs union. And this surely begs the question, why, why are we doing all of this if we're simply leaving to put in place a set of the same arrangements? And, it, and the reason that this is happening is because, as I said, it's proving impossible to deliver Brexit in the terms that it was sold to people. Like, you, you are just not going to see that £350 million extra per week, which swayed lots of people on the Leave side. Lots of floating voters in the EU referendum yep. voted on the basis that they thought £350 million extra per week is going to go into the NHS. We and, really and it's not going to happen. We, we, and it was a key promise that helped okay. persuade people. Dominic Cummings, the head of Vote Leave, said so. And this is what we've got to be talking about. You've talked. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Cheers. Well, let's get more on this and let's speak to the Conservative MP and the former leading Brexit campaigner, Bernard Jenkins. He joins us from Westminster. And um, the Prime Minister, just in the last few minutes, just making very clear that when it comes to the jurisdiction, it will be the UK law that comes first, not the ECJ. But still, lots of questions that potentially there could be some kind of U turn, a climb down, if you will, over the suggestion that they could still have an indirect role. Well, I think this is. Um slightly a storm in a teacup actually because if you're ending direct jurisdiction you're ending jurisdiction the european court of justice from day one will no longer have the power to direct our own courts or uh, to strike down laws made by parliament our courts will have to obey the law of parliament they will no longer obey the law of the european union because the Euro law of the european union will no longer apply to us now i think what the government has attempted to explain as reasonably as possible that, of course, we're not putting the whole country into legal isolation, cut off from the rest of the world. All Supreme Courts look at the jurisdictions of other countries and see how they're interpreting things. But where you have an agreement between two countries, that agreement needs to be arbitrated by an independent body. We cannot have the European Court of Justice uh, arbitrating on disputes between the United Kingdom and the EU, and that is not going to happen. So the, the really big change is happening. All the rest is almost just background noise, frankly. I mean, do you think it was wrong for the Prime Minister to have that hard line in the first place, speaking so adamantly, saying that we will be pulling out of the EU, which means we'll be pulling out in any relationship with the ECJ, and now it does look like there could be some form of relationship, and this is, this is where she's getting the criticism largely? No, well, I think actually, I thought you, I, I, I think she's absolutely right in what she said, and uh, uh, the government's going to deliver exactly what she said. Uh, what you are doing is inferring from the use of the word direct that there is some kind of indirect. Well, um, explain to me what it means, because um, I, d I don't think um, I don't think the word direct actually uh, clarifies very much or indirect. The fact is, you either have jurisdiction or you do not have jurisdiction. And the European Court of Justice will no longer have jurisdiction. Well, we're hopefully going to find out exactly what it means. But it does suggest that if we are going to have 
arbitration, a third party involved, it could mean that essentially there could be another foreign aspect to how our laws are governed and controlled and, and how the decisions are made. You're going to have foreign lawyers. Um, it, would be, it could potentially take place um, outside of the UK, in the EU, in Luxembourg. And this is potentially what many people voted against. We wanted to have well, laws... Uh Laws here in the UK controlled by here in the UK, not by foreign laws, not by foreigners. But we, we will be control of our own laws. Uh, whatever rulings made by um, uh, an international tribunal that's, for example, um, between the UK and the EU about a particular matter, uh, that will only be under international law. Statute law, the law of Parliament, will reign supreme in this country and our courts will have to obey that law. So democratic control will have been restored. What you are referring to are the dispute resolution mechanisms that always exist between countries. The EU has exactly these kind of arrangements with totally independent countries like Canada, with whom it has a free trade agreement uh, concluded recently. Those, that, that's, that kind of arrangement is perfectly normal. That's the sort of arrangement we want. Dominic Raab was actually saying that it's good to have an eye on the ECJ, an eye on the EU laws. Is, is that what you would want? Somebody, uh, yes, who, no, who, uh, somebody, somebody who, who pushed and, and pushed for the UK to leave the EU. Sh should we have an, the eye on the ECJ and EU laws? Well, we should certainly be aware. Even the US Supreme Court uh, has an eye on what the international courts are saying or what the um, other Supreme Courts are saying about issues um, like, you know, completely new issues about, like, surveillance and data and technological issues, all these things and, and how we interpret rights. Uh, there is, you know, th th uh, there's no legal system that operates behind a completely closed door and blocks its ears to what's going on in the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And we're not leaving the rest of the world, we're only leaving EU, we're not even leaving Europe, we're only leaving the, the institutions of the EU. OK, Bernard Jenkins. Thank you very much. Good talking to you. Thank you. Let's speak to Steve Pearce. He's a professor of law at the University of Essex and he joins me from Westminster this afternoon. Um, Steve, what do you make of this all? Was the Prime Minister wrong in the first place to have this hard line, this red line, if you like, on the ECJ and the role it's playing? Indeed, she is saying she is committed to the ECJ no longer having that jurisdiction over UK law, but it seems there could be some role. Well, it would have been easier to negotiate with the EU if... Uh, the uh, government hadn't completely ruled out a role for the ECJ. But now that it has, it's found itself in a position where it has to explain further what it meant. And some people are going to see that as backtracking, but uh, m maybe it's fair to say it's a, it's, a, it's a decent explanation of what they were trying to say. So the EU court won't rule in the same way it rules now over British uh, laws, issues that arise in Britain. But there will be some other types of international dispute settlement instead which the government uh, could sometimes lose, and the EU court may have a role in them. So it will still be around, but in a more limited form. Yeah, I mean, the, the former Attorney General, Dominic Grieve, has said it was pie in the sky to think that the ECJ wouldn't have any role. But lots of questions in terms of what kind of influence, what kind of role could the ECJ, could European courts um, have on UK law? Yes, I mean, the government's listed about uh, eight or ten different things it'd be willing to accept, and some of them have some role for the ECJ, and maybe arbitrators could ask it to give a ruling, or maybe British courts could take account of what it says without actually being obliged to do what it said. So those are all compromises that the government is saying it could accept, although maybe some really strongly anti-EU people wouldn't uh, be too happy with those, but the government is, is saying it's OK with those. I mean, what is so wrong for the European Court of Justice to have any kind of, any kind of influence? I mean, Vince Cable, he's saying that actually the European Court of Justice have, have done right by the, the UK in um, the past, of course, he is a Remainer. But even the Institute of um, Directors are calling for a pr pragmatic approach to make sure that we still do have conversations when needed, particularly if there are disputes, etc. Well, the main concern of the government is that the, the way the EU court works now, it has a kind of direct impact on British law. So British courts could set aside Act of Parliaments and um, you can get rights in uh, national courts in Britain, which you wouldn't get under British law, you'd get them under EU law. Now, for the people who win those cases, I suppose that's uh, 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 very appealing. I mean, there are environmental groups and... Uh, uh, women's equality groups and many others that, are, that have won claims like those. Uh, but the government, on principle, wants it to be British courts and British laws only which apply. So we move to a different system of a more informal or indirect influence of the EU court and of other international tribunals instead.
I mean, what about the, the creation of, of arbitration, a third party, a neutral third party, um, which, has been, um, which has been put forward? Um, what kind of role could, could that play? Could it still mean that actually when it comes to EU courts, when it comes to the European courts of justice, they could actually be playing more of a role than, than people necessarily wanted, particularly people who voted to leave? Well, what the government's saying is that there are precedents with the EU and uh, other countries where arbitrators could end up asking the EU court to give a ruling. In fact, they probably mm. have to, from the EU's point of view, if they're ruling on EU law and binding the EU. Because the EU court's always said, well, we can't have foreign arbitrators binding us. It's sort of the mirror image of the UK government's concern about foreign courts binding them. The EU side doesn't want uh, foreign courts binding them either. So uh, they want uh, the arbitrators to ask the EU court for a ruling. And that, in a way, very indirectly allows the EU court to have an impact on the UK after Brexit. It's be much more limited than what happens now, but still it might be too much for some people who voted leave. OK, um, Steve Pearce, I'm speaking to us from, from the University of Essex, speaking to us from Westminster. Good talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has accused Mrs May of softening her stance. The government is clearly backtracking on its earlier red lines and saying there has to be some form of uh, dispute resolution through some form of judicial process, and that obviously is the case, and we've indeed said that all along. We get the Brexit bill to the House when we go back in September. Our first concern is parliamentary scrutiny. We'll be ensuring that Parliament has a right to vote on every single section of the bill. We don't want the return of Henry VIII and decisions by the executive over an elected Parliament. The former Lord Chancellor and Justice Secretary Lord Faulkner is in our Westminster studio. Lord Faulkner, good to speak to you. Um, now, there seems to be a lot of attention around this nuance of direct jurisdiction today as opposed to jurisdiction from what the Prime Minister said back in January. What is direct jurisdiction? Direct jurisdiction is where a court in Europe actually resolves rights between individual uh, people. But what this paper that's been produced today appears to envisage is there's going to be some court which is going to be in some way above uh, both the European Union and the United Kingdom that's going to resolve disputes about the agreements that we're going to enter into because everybody envisages that we're going to enter into agreements with the European Union about, for example, EU citizens here, for example, about trade, and for example, about the budget. Now, if there are disputes about any, three, any one of those three areas, which there are bound to be in the years to come. For example, is somebody entitled to stay here if they're an EU citizen? For example, if you've got a consumer right that comes from an agreement that we've made with Europe, what precisely are the terms of that consumer right? And there needs to be some court that can tell the European Union and the UK if they disagree about what these rights mean as to what these rights do actually mean. And that's going to have to be some sort of court that sits outside the European Union and the United Kingdom. And what's more, that court is going to apply lots and lots of European Union law concepts, as the paper today acknowledges. And as the paper today acknowledges, the court with the greatest expertise on that is the European Court of Justice, which is going to play a significant part in what goes, goes in the future. So it... Mrs May, in that clip of the speech that you showed of her in January, misstated the position. She said today that nothing has changed. Well, what's happened is the British government's plans have come up against reality. Namely, if you make an agreement with the European Union, there's got to be some court that isn't British and isn't European Union that pleases it. And that's the reality. But what might that court look like? Would it still be made up of judges from the UK and the EU? I don't know, because in this extraordinary paper that's been produced today, they say there's got to be a court. They indicate that this court might ask the European Court of Justice for its views about European Union law. But the paper is so vague, it doesn't indicate what the precise form of this court subsequently will be. So you've got, I think, two big problems coming out of this paper. First of all, it's vague and it must be extremely exasperating for those with whom we are negotiating that we will not pin our colours to the masts. And secondly and separately, it's engaged in a process of trying to disguise a climb down. And 
In that regard, do Brexiteers have a point that they could rightly be worried about this because it implies that EU judges could still be influencing UK law post-Brexit? explicitly acknowledges that EU judges will be influencing UK law. It expressly refers to a process whereby you could ask the European Court of Justice for an advisory opinion. Now, that seems to me to be perfectly sensible if what you're dealing with is an issue which is based upon concepts of European law and which have got to be applied in 27 EU countries. So I would imagine the Brexiteers are spitting at the paper because it's not what Mrs May told them was going to happen in January of this year. And in that respect, is it very different from what uh, came out a few days ago about the possibility of, of joining the EFTA court? Um, it seems like you're describing a very similar sort of body, really. Yeah, I am. And the, the EFTA court, which, I mean, they don't, they don't commit themselves to the EFTA court, but the EFTA court is effectively a body that isn't a European Union court, is set up by the EFTA countries, which are countries that have a very close association with the European Union, and which, over the years that it has been in existence, has very closely followed the decisions of the European Court of Justice. It doesn't have direct effect in the sense that its decisions aren't the decisions of the European Court, but it follows very closely what they decide. And so the influence of the European Court is going to be quite strong. And I think that is the significance of this word direct, which has been introduced mm. into the government's thinking over the past few days. And in terms of our Supreme Court here in the UK, is it, not, is it possible that if there is some sort of new body, some new court that has to rule on these issues, that the Supreme Court in this country could eventually overturn them or repeal them? Is that a possibility? Well, the, the, the effect of the new arrangement will be that the Supreme Court will be the final arbiter of domestic law issues. But suppose that there is a position where the British court's view is one view about the agreement we've reached, say, on consumer rights, and courts in Germany or Italy take a different view as to what that agreement that we've reached equals, there needs to be a body mm. above both the UK courts, not necessarily above, but separate from the UK courts and the European country courts that says, actually, this is what this agreement means. And then once that court, which might be like the EFTA court, has ruled, then its decisions can be given effect to by the domestic courts. So there's going to have to be some court that sits beside our court system and the European court system, which resolves disputes about what do these consumer rights mean, what do these citizen rights mean. Just uh, finally, broadening it out to all the position papers that we've seen in the last week, um, you, did, you mentioned earlier, I think you said the phrase that they're sort of coming up against reality. What have you made of the position papers in general that we've seen so far? There are bits and pieces in them that represent progress being made. Uh, for example, there's quite good stuff about how we should make sure that we continue to agree which courts have jurisdiction on what, which cases. But by and large, they are vague, they are very imprecise, they are quite poor quality, and they don't generally advance our negotiating position that much. For example, they don't indicate what we've got in mind for frictionless customs. For example, they don't indicate what is the form of the court that's going to resolve disputes. For example, they don't really propose how you avoid a hard border in Ireland, and there is no paper on the budget and the budget issues are the issues that are preventing us getting forward to the future relationship with the European Union, which is the key issue. So I don't know what the government is doing, but what the government is not doing is focusing in at the moment on identifying the real issues that need to be resolved in the next few weeks and proposing solutions to the European Union in the context of the negotiations. Lord Faulkner, good to speak to you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. In the latest of its proposals for life after Brexit, the government has published its plans on how it wants to end the legal authority of the European Court of Justice in UK affairs. At the moment, the court can influence everything from workers' rights to trade rules. Now Theresa May says it will no longer have what she calls a direct say in these matters. But in what critics see as a climb down, the new plan appears to allow the European Court to have some role 
in future disputes between the EU and Britain. Here's our political correspondent, Ben Wright. It's about bringing power back to Britain. We will take back control of our laws and bring an end to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in Britain. And for many Leave campaigners, that's what Brexit was all about. Take back democracy and take back control for our country. Now, can we do it? Yes. Yes. As it reveals its ideas for how disputes between the EU and the UK might be hammered out in the future, the Prime Minister denied the government was ditching its big red line. We're very clear, we won't have the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. We will put in place arrangements to ensure that businesses have the confidence of knowing they can continue to trade across the European Union. So what is the European Court of Justice and why does it matter? It's because this Luxembourg court is the EU's ultimate legal authority, refereeing disputes between EU institutions and member states. Its judgments have shaped everything from our food standards to workers' rights. For many people, it's really become the sort of totemic representation of our lack of control of our own laws because basically, you know, ministers can find themselves being forced to change UK law because the ECJ has said what we're trying to do here, laws that Parliament's passed, are incompatible with the EU law and we have to change things. But going forward, we're going to have some sorts of relations with the EU and that means we're not going to be able to divorce ourselves from the influence of the ECJ completely. And that's the dilemma for the government. So, what does today's paper tell us about its aims? Well, ministers today accepted they would have to keep half an eye on rulings by EU judges after Brexit. New arbitration bodies will have to be created to ensure the EU and the UK are playing by the same rules when a trade deal is done. Although the ECJ would not have direct jurisdiction over the UK, its judges may have a role interpreting EU law. And opposition parties here see the government's position shifting. The government is clearly backtracking on its earlier red lines and saying there has to be some form of uh, dispute resolution through some form of judicial process, and that obviously is the case, and we've indeed said that all along. What the Prime Minister is now recognising is that there will be a role for the European Court, uh, whether it's, for instance, in relation to the withdrawal agreement, the transition period, or even post-Brexit in terms of the ECJ law, the European Court law that we've incorporated uh, into UK law. And the SNP urged the government to rub out its red line on the ECJ completely. It's revealing too that most pro-Brexit Tory MPs seem pretty comfortable with the direction the government's going on this. And it's a fact that once Britain leaves the European Union, judgments by the European Court of Justice will no longer be binding on UK courts. One of the big questions for the negotiations, though, is the extent Britain chooses to follow EU law and judgments in return for close cooperation on trade, security and more. So what happens next? The chief negotiators from Britain and the EU will resume their talks in Brussels next week. And there have already been disagreements between the two sides on the role the ECJ should have in the future. Today's paper from the UK may smooth things over a bit. It shows that they are accepting there are painful trade-offs to be made and the fact that they are now saying that if they won't accept the direct effect of the Court of Justice, they could accept it indirectly affecting the UK post-Brexit is quite constructive from an EU point of view. Centuries of laws piled high in Westminster and restoring Parliament's sovereignty is fundamental to Brexit. But the UK is not about to leap into legal isolation and EU law, as shaped by the ECJ, will still be relevant here long after we've left. Ben Wright, BBC News, Westminster. Now let's talk to our legal affairs correspondent, Clive Coleman. Clive, can we say this is the end of the court's influence over UK affairs? We can say no more direct jurisdiction. The court's judgments will no longer be binding on UK courts, so in that sense its influence has gone. However, the government's paper centres around the Brexit agreement on trade, uh, and it, that's likely to involve a lot of EU law. If we want to sell our cars into Germany, we'll have to meet its, the EU's emission standards. The ECJ interprets EU law on trade, so some influence could remain there. Just give me an example. I mean, how will this affect you know, people like you and me? Well, the ECJ has developed law across many areas, including disability rights, consumers' rights, workers' rights. A while ago, it ruled that workers who were uh, working overtime had the right to have that 
calculated as part of their holiday pay. So if there's another ruling from the ECJ extending workers' rights, we won't get the benefit of that. On the other hand, the government could, for instance, zero rate some goods for VAT, including uh, ladies' sanitary products, which, remember, was a big issue some time ago. Well, that's individuals. What about business? What about trading? Well, that's where I think it becomes more complicated. Um, the government is throwing out a series of different options on resolving disputes under the trade agreement. So a joint committee, a court of arbitration, panel of arbitration. Now, if the, there is a dispute there, then there, again, there could be a role for the ECJ. This paper says that, for instance, by reference to a post-Brexit judgment of the court, that could be used, for instance, to resolve a dispute. So potentially a continuing role. All right, Clive. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Adam Fleming is at the European Court of Justice in Luxembourg uh, for us. Adam, so we know what Britain wants out of all of this, but let's not forget this is a negotiation. Yes, George, and we can split this into the short term, medium term and long term. In the short term, the first test will come next week when David Davis and his opposite number, Michel Barnier, will sit down for a further round of Brexit talks. Top of the agenda, the rights of EU citizens living in the UK after Brexit, which Europe wants to be guaranteed by the ECJ and the UK disagrees. In the medium term, Mr Barnier has proposed that issues that come out of the Brexit agreement, the final deal, they could be solved by a joint committee of officials from each side. But if they can't reach agreement, that would then go to the ECJ for the final say. You can imagine the UK signing up to the first part of that but not the second. And as for the long term, which is the final permanent deal between the EU and the UK, that is an issue for phase two of the Brexit talks, which will not start until the end of this year at the very, very earliest. All right, long way to go. Adam, thank you very much. Theresa May has rejected claims that she's watered down her Brexit promise to take back control of British laws. A new document setting out Britain's negotiating position says the European Court of Justice should have no direct authority in the UK. Well, that immediately sparked speculation about exactly what indirect authority the court might have. Here's more from our political correspondent, Emily Morgan. Taking back control of our laws. That was one of the key pledges during the referendum campaign. But will we really take back as much control as we were promised? The Prime Minister isn't in any doubt. Visiting a bus factory in Surrey today, she said when we leave the EU, our courts will be in the driving seat. When we leave the European Union, we will be leaving the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. What we will be able to do is to make our own laws, Parliament will make our laws, it is British judges who will interpret those laws, and it will be the British Supreme Court that will be the ar ultimate arbiter of those laws. Critics point out, though, the paper published today says we'll only leave the direct jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, giving EU judges a future role in British courts. Well, the government is clearly backtracking on its earlier red lines and saying there has to be some form of uh, dispute resolution through some form of judicial process, and that obviously is the case, and we've indeed said that all along. The European Court of Justice is the ultimate arbiter of EU law and is supreme over UK courts. It's enforced hundreds of measures here, including equal pay and sick pay. But in 1981, it prevented the reduction of tax on beer, forcing the Chancellor to increase the price. After Brexit, the government wants to end the court's supremacy here, instead giving power back to UK courts and using a new mechanism to solve disputes between the EU and the UK. Whether that's an arbitration panel or a committee, one top former civil servant says there's no escaping some European influence. It's inevitably going to end up with some sort of arrangement where there are European representatives, they may be you know, in a negotiating committee, it may be politicians or diplomats, but I think it's very unrealistic to think that the EU would allow the sole oversight of a UK-EU agreement to be in the UK. But Brexit campaigners have for years argued Britain shouldn't be ruled by judges sitting in Luxembourg. Are they then upset to hear they could still have a role? No, not a bit of it. At the moment they apply the law of the European Union over and above the law of Parliament. That will end, we have our democracy back. I would say to all those reading the paper who are a bit worried, relax, people like me are not worried at all and we're here to make sure that we take back control. So the Prime Minister set out the government's direction of travel and her party appear to be right behind her. Her next move will be to persuade Brussels.
And that will all start again next week when the Brexit Secretary David Davis heads back out to Brussels for the next round of talks. Issues in here will be discussed and thrashed out. The role the ECJ has on the whole Brexit process is crucial and needs to be agreed before other areas can be discussed, like trade. The government hopes that will be in October, but unless this is some of this is agreed, then that could well delay the whole process. OK, Emily Morgan at Westminster, thank you. So the Prime Minister is quite clear. After Brexit, the UK will be leaving the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. But that's not stopped critics claiming that her government has rode back on taking back control of the legal process. Indeed, the latest and one of the most significant position papers it has yet published today conceded that the European Court of Justice could remain the last legal port of call during any transition after Brexit, if not longer. Paul McNamara reports. She may sit atop of our courts, but for decades Lady Justice has had a higher master. Today, the government laid out proposals of how to strip the power of European courts from our justice system. When we leave the European Union, we will be leaving the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. What we will be able to do is to make our own laws, Parliament will make our laws, it is British judges who will interpret those laws, and it will be the British Supreme Court that will be the ultimate arbiter of those laws. And in today's position paper on the power of courts post-Brexit, the very first paragraph appears to say just that. Although there is a small but important devil in the detail. That one word, direct. We may be out of direct jurisdiction, but will we still be in the indirect jurisdiction of the European Court? Where Theresa May was unequivocal, the government's paper today is less so. It leaves open the possibility of the European Courts of Justice keeping its jurisdiction during the Brexit transition period, possibly much later than March 2019. And in the future, any new disputes between the EU and the UK could be required to take account of, or even be bound by, the rulings of the ECJ. This position paper talks about replicating language of EU laws in some circumstances, joint committees and arbitration processes with Europe. That doesn't quite sound like a clear-cut break from European lawmakers and total sovereign control. So are these proposals what Brexit voters voted for? We asked the people of Leave Voting Reigate what they thought. Disgraceful. Absolutely disgraceful. I don't like the idea of not being completely free. It seems a bit ridiculous. Do you think that if we were following Brexit, we wouldn't have to be beholden to them. Well, I think the vote was to get our sovereignty back, and that includes British justice. And if we're still going to be dealing with Europe, that seems amazing to me. Even if it's only a small little say-so here and there on particular issues? Oh, yeah. I think it needs to be clean-cut. Brexit. If the majority have chosen Brexit, then we need to leave fully. <laughs> to be honest, I couldn't care less. Justice Minister Dominic Raab campaigned for Brexit and is adamant the government's delivering exactly what people voted for. Do you think the British people understood these nuances when you personally were actively campaigning for Britain to take back control last year. Oh, I talked about arbitration processes all the time. It's what I used to do before becoming a politician. Do you think people really understood all that? No, not really, but as we get down to the detail... Isn't that very important that they understood the detail? Look, look, I'm not going to tell the British public what they take an interest in, but as we get down to the detail of this, we're going to put meat on the bones. That's what we're doing today. What the British public wants to know is we're taking back control over our laws and ending the jurisdiction of the ECJ. For critics, though, this is a climb down and a welcome one at that. Until now, what the Prime Minister has been doing has been playing to the Eurosceptic gallery. What has finally hit home uh, is that the European Court will continue to have a role. Uh, but what I think this also highlights is the European Court has actually been very positive for the UK, UK consumers, holiday makers and indeed businesses. One point the government does make clear in today's paper is the rights of EU citizens living on UK shores. They will only be subject to British law. This is a major sticking point with the EU, a proposal unlikely to hold water across the channel. Paul McNamara reporting well from West London. We're joined by former Shadow Business Secretary Labour MP Chukar Amuna. And with me is Conservative MP and co-founder of the Pro Leave Group during the referendum campaign, Grassroots Out, Peter Bone. Peter Bone, the former Attorney General, Dominic Greaves, says this notion that we'll be able to extricate ourselves fully from the European Court of Justice is just pie in the sky. 
Well, I think he's absolutely wrong. I mean, we heard what the Prime Minister said. She was absolutely right. And uh, when we come out of the EU, the European Court will have no... Uh, won't be able to determine what happens here. And that's quite, uh, quite clear. And, and it will be very difficult to read the position paper and come up with any other conclusion than that. Well, some members of the government seem to concede that extricating ourselves completely will be quite difficult. Justice Minister said this morning, Dominic Raab, we'd have to keep half an eye on the case law yeah, of the European mm. Court of Justice. Well, if they've got nothing to do with this, why do we have to keep any eye on it? But them? you didn't quite finish because it also said they'd have to keep half an eye on what we did. And that, clearly, you will look at the Supreme Courts of each country and, and you would, we would take account and listen to what the Americans... But is we... that extricating yourself course, completely? Because the, the point is, the European Court will no longer determine, be the final arbitrator of what happens. And that's clear. And what, what was the key issue in the referendum was we make our own laws in our own countries and it's our own judges that determine it. And that's what we've got today, and we should rejoice that. Tuka Ramuna, this is exactly what the public voted for. Well, I'm not sure it was. I mean, let's first of all take stock. We're over a year out from that referendum. We're over five months after the triggering of Article 50, and only now is the government coming forward with these position papers. And the reason they said they were doing that was to provide more certainty as to what their position is. Well, on this, they've looked at and put forward seven different scenarios. We don't know which one they envisage pursuing, uh, which, of course, for businesses that your viewers, you know, they rely on the jobs, it doesn't create the certainty that they need. And the second point is this. The key, one of the key promises, and Peter was talking about it there, that the Vote Leave campaign made, was that European judges will have no impact, no influence on the implementation, um, sorry, the interpretation of law and rules that govern this country. And it's very clear from the different scenarios that have been suggested that they do envisage the European Court of Justice at least playing some role, um, account being taken of its jurisprudence. So that is yet another promise that was made to the people that was broken. Now, I'm relaxed about that because I wanted us to stay in the European Union. And I don't share the analysis of Peter on the sovereignty point. But increasingly, you are seeing that the Brexit in but the terms that it was sold to the British public is proving very, impossible, but, but just briefly, absolutely I'm, impossible for the government to deliver. The Prime Minister and Peter Bone have made it quite clear. They say once we're out of the EU, the European Court will have no jurisdiction over UK laws. Why do you dispute that? What evidence do you have of that? Well, I'll give you an example. One of the scenarios that is put forward in the paper is for the um, European Free Trade Association Court to act as an arbiter on the governing of the relationship in part between the UK and the European Union after we depart. Now, uh, the EFTA court generally pays attention to and follows the precedent of the European Court of Justice. So I just give that as one example. But Peter, of course, in addition to the sovereignty and the legal point, the other very big issue, I, I don't agree with Peter on this about the big thing for people. I think the number one issue that detect, dictated okay. how many people voted is whether they were going to get their £350 okay, so million P pounds extra before we going into public services. And there's no sign of that Peter happening Bone, at all. Peter Bone, for a second, promise. if you would. When, when, Peter Bone, this when, is a broken when, promise. When somebody speaks for so long, it normally means they haven't actually got anything to say. And I think Chuck had just proved that point. The truth of the matter is, when they're... When they're no, stop, you've had your go. Chuck, shush, for a minute, shush. When you have two organisations, one the European Union and one UK, and there's a dispute, you have to have a neutral body to sort it out. And that's what that paper talks about. And you cannot read that paper without coming to that conclusion that the European Court will no longer rule over the United Kingdom. Very briefly, I mean, is it possible when there will be disputes with the EU that that neutral body, if you like, can be outside completely of European law. That's just not possible, well, what, is it? The, the most obvious one is the World Trade Organization, and it talks in the paper quite a lot about that. Very well-established disputes procedure, and I would think that's the one we'll opt for. Very brief, briefly, Chukura Muna, I mean, you know, what is Labour's very specific policy on this? Because on other issues, they've fallen behind the government on this, haven't they? Well, look, on the European Court of Justice, the Labour Party is very clear that the continued role that European Court of Justice jurisprudence had 
has on the way law operates here should not be a red line because what it would do is prevent us continuing to benefit from some of the good things, lots of the good things that we get from the European Union now, like being part of and engaged with the European Nuclear Chuka. Atomic Agency, which helps cancer Chuka. treatment in our NHS. That surely is a good thing I'm we want to continue to with. You, but I'm going to have to end it there. Chuka Ramuna, Peter Bone, thank, thank you. you very much for joining us. Now, how much jurisdiction will European judges have over our laws after we leave the EU? For the government, the answer is simple. None whatsoever. But, as with all things Brexit, it may be more complicated. For Theresa May, this is one of her red lines. Having full control over the law is an essential part of the UK regaining its sovereignty. So you'd expect that after we leave the EU and the transition is done, that's it. Well, not quite. Today, the government set out a discussion document. So when will we take back control? Chris Cook has been taking a look at what ministers want. One of the things we thought we knew about life after we leave the EU was that the European Court of Justice wouldn't be part of it. But let me be clear. We are not leaving the European Union today to give up control of immigration again and we're not leaving only to return to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. So we will take back control of our laws and bring an end to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice in Britain. We want to make sure that we are ending, that we are ending the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. For some Brexiters, it was enormously important that all of our laws should be written by our parliaments and they should be interpreted by our courts, including the Supreme Court. And that meant ending the role of the European Court of Justice. The ECJ, you see, is the body that makes sure EU law is evenly applied across the whole European Union. It's a thing that turns the rights and responsibilities in the treaties into reality. Let's suppose, after Brexit, that we sign a comprehensive free trade deal that lets European businesses trade freely in the UK and vice versa. The government's plan is that, here in Britain, our courts should enforce those rights, with no cases sent to the ECJ. The thing is, though, to take a few examples, the EU's agreements with Canada, Singapore and the members of the European Economic Area contain courts. Why? For the same reason our government is proposing a new UK-EU court. We need a sort of enforcement mechanism, that's really what you have to think of this as, because if we've gone to the bother of agreeing rules in some deep and uh, comprehensive free trade agreement, the people who feel perhaps they're not getting the access they should under that agreement want some way of getting redress. So if you've been trying to export to an EU country, you think its rules are discriminating against you, you want some way of appealing to another authority to say, actually, these people aren't abiding by the rules. Uh, I think overall this is a really informative and pretty useful paper. And what came through most strongly for me is the fact that so much attention is being devoted to how to ensure alignment between our our legal system and the EU legal system after we've left means the government now has one of its priorities to ensure we can keep trading by making sure our legal system is as closely aligned to that of the EU as possible. But there may be problems, not least with escaping the ECJ's influence. First, a deep relationship with the EU probably means aligning our regulations to theirs. But the more we do that, the more the ECJ will matter. For example, in, in the field of aviation, outside the EU, uh, if there is an arbitration panel, and of course these arbitrations would not be at the European Court of Justice, but since all the rules and all the regulations are adopted at EU level, they continue to be uh, interpreted by European Court of Justice, and this arbitration would really be instructed to take all that case law into account. Second, the EU may want a bigger role for the ECJ in its relationship with Britain. I mean, for me, there are two potential sticking points. The first is to do with ratification, because remember, this is about the trade deal, and the trade deal has to be approved not just by the European Council, but by the national parliaments of the member states. And there I wonder whether all parliaments will agree to setting up a bespoke new adjudication mechanism. And the big problem is there are still some areas, like the rights of EU citizens in the UK, where the EU is insisting that EU law should apply, and for that, you have to have a role for the European Court of justice and there's no obvious or easy way around that. Third, you can enforce your EU rights at a local court. 
But who will get to take cases to the new EU-UK body? It's not clear to me that these proposals would allow a business which has uh, difficulties exporting to France, for example, to actually access a court directly and, and make their claims under the agreement. This would all have to be done between the UK government and the European Union. And so uh, not only business, but if there are rights also for, for, for people to move or other rights, uh, they would not be directly enforceable in the same way as they are now. Our government now has a settled view on which court should be supreme. But the ECJ may not go away. And businesses in particular may worry about how they enforce their rights.